Hey all, Doug Padgett here. Thanks for listening to my podcast. Here's an interview I did with Amanda Henderson. Amanda is a, a fantastic person and is executive director of the Interfaith Alliance of Colorado and has been a friend of mine for quite a number of years. And she is a, a pastor in the Disciples of Christ Christian Church tradition. But she's written this book called Holy Chaos. And it deals with issues that are so relevant today about how do we engage in these times with one another in a way that can bring about uh, healing across political divides and a little bit of hope in our world. So I'm really thrilled to bring you this conversation. It's also part of the Vote Common Good podcast, which if you don't already subscribe to, you might like it. There's a number of uh, really great podcasts that come out on the Vote Common Good podcast. So take a look at that one. And here's my conversation with Amanda Henderson. No All right. So, hey, everybody, Doug Padgett here, um, Vote Common Good uh, podcast and um, live stream interviews with Amanda Henderson, who is uh, the director of the Interfaith Alliance of Colorado. Have I said that right? The Interfaith That's Alliance it. of Colorado, which is an organization that works with leaders and faith leaders and uh, interfaith faith leaders um, to try to advocate for uh, a better society and better life and better world. She is also uh, the author of a new book called Holy Chaos, and um, the, the book wants to raise the subject of how in these conflictual times do we find places of true connection and um, life with one another. Is that, is that about right? That's about right. Yeah. How do we navigate the the complexity of, of uh, really divisive issues at the intersection of religion and politics. Well, I, I, you know, I run this group of Vote Common Good, of course, and so I think the most divisive place of religion and politics and uh, civic life uh, surround um, the person of Donald Trump and his behavior as president. And I'm sure you all have been in, in writing this book, you were, uh, had that in mind, but it's much broader than that, and it's broader than that for the point of our conversation today. While some of us are uniquely obsessed with the damage that this uh, human being is doing while he's in a role that he's incompetent to fulfill, people like you are um, uh, taking that into account, but actually wanting to see it in a much larger scale, a m- much larger frame. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, and I, actually that my the opening story in my book is the day after the election of Donald Trump and the ways that I was feeling um, just heartbroken and upset and concerned. And my family, uh, most of my family voted for Donald Trump. And the morning after the election, I was headed to the hospital to meet my parents where my dad Mm. was heading in for surgery. And, and so I texted my mom when I woke up and said, Hey, I'm not ready to talk about this today and needed to really bracket, um, my feelings around all that to be able to be there with my parents that day. And, and they felt the same and we've processed it a little bit and, uh, they still support Donald Trump and we still disagree on a lot of those things, but we love each other. And so how do we navigate this, especially when we feel, I feel, um, very concerned about the ways that our country is going Mm. and about the ways that marginalized folks are so clearly impacted in life and death ways. And my own family's impacted in life and death ways. And Mm -hmm. how do we both muddle through the daily realities of life with those we love who have different views than us Mm -hmm. on life and death issues? And how do we continue to advocate and speak out and, and move for what we believe is right. The chapters of the book, uh, I think, are really interesting, and they I want, I want to ask you about two of them in particular. Um, and so for people who already have the, the digital version of the book, and you can talk about why there's been sort of a staggered release date because of having to do with COVID and printers and all. Uh, for a lot of people, they don't know that books are released on Tuesdays. That's something I've learned as an author, that uh, the way movies come out on Fridays, uh, books are always released on Tuesdays. So um, a couple of Tuesdays ago was your scheduled release date. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. May 20th was our uh, the date that it was supposed to come out and, and actually wound up coming out on uh, ebook on that date. And then the print version official release date will be July 14th. 
Uh, I understand it's gotten printed a little faster. Things got a little uh, out of whack because the print houses wound up pausing during COVID-19. And so the printing itself got a little bit backed up. So some people have the print book already and others uh -huh. uh, getting it in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, well, and, and part of what I find interesting about that, not only just the fact that, you know, there's the complications of the printing industry, which I find kind of nerdy and fun, but also that the, the content in the book is so spot on for right these last couple of weeks. Um, like one of the chapters that I want to ask you about, uh, talk about s second is one called I can't breathe yeah. seeing fear. Um, yeah. do, do you want to talk about that one right now? That's, you know, in the yeah, book, it's, absolutely. it's chapter, it's chapter four. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, you have great chapter titles by the way. So I think it's impressive whenever someone can write good chapter titles. Were these your chapter titles? Were they editors they chapter were. titles? Yeah, no, they were all, they were my chapter titles. Wow. Um, and, well and that chapter, and I'm heartbroken that it is so relevant again, of mm -hmm. course. Um, but I wrote that chapter about the days after Eric Gardner's, um, death in New York of similar, um, like so many we're seeing in the past few days of people who were yeah. of black men who were killed by police and chokeholds and being strangled, um, and in the days after Eric Garner's and death in 2014, I think so many of us in the white progressive community who had thought that the election of Barack Obama and that the world that we as a white person lived in thought that we had made yeah. some progress around racial inequality and racism really came to see, nope, uh, racism did not disappear. It evolved and we are seeing it in yeah. such clear ways with videos. So um, in those days, I went to my first protest. So that is the story of the first time that I stepped out and went into a space. Uh, and it was actually a 7.30 in the morning uh, protest, which you would think would be a pretty harmless type of space. Not many people are really riled up. And I had a few friends who were part of the Black Lives Matter movement founding here in Denver. And one of my close friends was leading that uh, event. And our intention was to go to the Colorado State Capitol mm -hmm. and to go inside and to lay down in the main um, foyer and to say, I can't breathe um, 11 times, which is what had happened to Eric Garner. And we got there that morning at 7.30 with our coffee and breakfast burritos, you know, a real wild protest. And we discovered that the Colorado State Capitol had been shut down out of fear. They mm -hmm. shut down the Capitol, a space that should be open to the public all the time, and said that it was because of our protest. Wow. And there were about 50 people there. I was wearing my clergy collar. There were a lot of us clergy who were there. Uh, a mom who's an activist with her teenage son, who she's a black woman. And so this group was sitting there and so you closed down the Capitol for us uh, because of fear. And, and so we wound up actually circling the building as far as we could get around and, and singing and chanting. Mm -hmm. And eventually they realized that we weren't going to leave. So they invited a group of eight folks to go up and have a conversation with the Lieutenant governor. And so I was one of those eight and as we're walking into the Capitol, we had tight security mm. and we had to go. You always have to go through security when you walk into the state Capitol. But I saw that there were about 30 police officers all standing guard right at that section right. for eight of us, mostly dressed in clergy garb and a mother and her teenage son. And I caught eye contact with one of the young white police officers and I saw this look of fear in his eyes. Mm. And I thought, what is he so afraid of? He's afraid of us. Yeah. And, and I just realized this deep um, disconnection around fear and mm. power. And how do we navigate that? And how do we, we step into spaces where we feel afraid and lean in? Or how do we listen to that fear and how do we navigate that? So that's what that chapter was about. Well, I, well, I, I can't wait to, to, to fully devour it. Um, and you and you obviously had some 
concern, trepidation, worry, fear of, of your own go, going into that? Uh, yeah, guessing? actually, that's how I started the chapter is my own waking up that morning early and and driving down and, and knowing, you know, I have been watching, um, like many of us yeah. have the past couple of weeks, uh, watching the protests on TV and, and seeing people tear gassed and and seeing violence break out and feeling my own fear. Yeah. Because I hadn't stepped into one of those spaces. And uh, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, actually, on Saturday, I guess a week and a half ago, we went to the protest here um, to support George Floyd's and to call for reform. And my son is 14 and he is Filipino. So he is a person of color and he's been watching on social media and seeing all of the things that were happening. And, and I said, um, hey, bud, do you want to come with us to the protest? We're going to go down today. And he said, no, no, I don't want to go. And I said, yeah, wh um, what's, why don't you want to go? And he said, I've seen what's happening and I don't, I'm scared about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so to be able to meet him in that place of fear and say, I hear you and we're going to go at noon. We're not going to go after curfew and there will be other families there and young people. And I will make sure that we are keeping our space and, but it's important for us to move into those spaces, even when we feel a little scared. Right. And, and so how do we navigate that fear with the real need um, to move into those? So in, in the book, I have a little nerdy chart about how we know if fear is uh, our body telling us we genuinely need to run from the bear right? Mm. <laughs> or put our arms up or there's this physiological mm. gift of fear to tell us when we're in real danger. Mm. And if that's the case, we need to stay calm and get out. Right. Yeah. But if that fear is discomfort, um, or it's a fear that we decide it's a risk worth taking. Uh, we were talking about, you know, in the time of COVID-19, there's this additional fear with going to protests. Yeah. I have to make a decision for me and who I am, is this a fear that I need to be okay stepping into because the risk is worth it? Right, right. Yeah. Is um, it, is it, does is it require it bravery or does it require, you know, uh, uh, moving away? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a real question. And we have to navigate it all the time. So, so you'd mentioned this, that, that story that you, you told about from uh, responding to Eric Gardner's murder by police in New York. That was your first protest. That was my first protest. Why, why do you think you had stayed out of protest um, before? Do you... well, I think that I didn't know uh, before that. And, and that's, you know, part of what I hope this book does as well is I didn't grow up in a community or a family where people were, when I hadn't learned to be aware of the real issues and systemic mm -hmm. issues of injustice in our communities. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that's important right now is to not hold guilt about, you know, I wasn't born into a protest family. Yeah, right. <laughs> I love my family, but they weren't a protest family. And so I hadn't, um, I just didn't know. And, and before that, uh, and so that's part of the work that I've been doing over these years mm -hmm. is looking back and understanding what do I believe and why, mm. and where did that come from and how do I want to act on what I believe mm -hmm. and what does it take and look like to step into those spaces to actually live into my hopes for the world. And, and things are really changing, aren't they? Like I, I feel it. I feel like uh, energy is shifting, but I also feel like the call on, um, on people of white culture and white bodies is changing and what we should do. I, 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 I've learned a lot about the role of racism white supremacy in our society, something that I have known about, but not integrated into the way I've needed to live. It's been uh, yeah, a, a lot of the way that, you know, I think about a lot of other crisis issues in our world that I really don't have to deal with, whether that be war or other kinds of violence or the, the environment or, you know, basically the, the implications of E equals MC squared, like all things that really matter to the foundation of how we understand our world. I really don't know a lot of things. And, I, and, and so I've learned a lot about issues of white supremacy and racism. And I've also recognized that in my lifetime, uh, you know, as a 53 year old, that the conversation about how to deal with race as white people, 
uh, we've been offered many versions of, of this over time, some of which I've not taken advantage of and some of which I have. And there was a period of time when the woke thing, the arrived thing, the, the person who was paying attention was told to do was to function as if colorblind. Right. Yeah. That, that was a thing. And I know that some people uh, act like that wasn't a deal, but it really was a deal. Like it was, Absolutely. you know, it, it was uh, uh, um, I, I'm thinking about uh, Ebony and Ivory. Well, who, who are the two? Elton John and, and, yeah. Yeah. and Stevie Wonder, Stevie Wonder like, did that. Yeah. yeah. Right. And like that was the thing. Right. Like like here it is that the two have come together and sort of the 1980s, ni- early 90s version of. Uh, and, and, you know, we started to recognize that when Stephen Colbert would sort of mock that as like, well, I don't even see color. Well, the reason right. he could mock that is that that was a thing that people like me, at least in my world, were sort of told, like, don't recognize that. Even if you're describing people in a group, like, don't say, oh, it's the black man over there, because that would be to articulate. And and. Yeah. You know, we've been sort of navigating. And I'm not letting myself off the hook at all. I'm just saying that that has really changed. And yeah. I've known that as I've grown and and gotten older, and hopefully also matured, not of which are all this always the same thing, that <laughs> uh, that the demands are really different, right? And like now, uh, this past two weeks, I've committed to wearing in public, as I am now, a Black Lives Matter T-shirt. Um, yes. That I was not comfortable even two years ago that I could wear that. That that yeah. it, that wasn't my claim that wasn't my statement i needed to um uh not act as if that's a logo that i'm going to be acquiring and now that feels like even in the last few weeks that 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 has changed and all this all this dynamic uh that that has gone on and you and your interfaith work that's been so active in politics and now we're in a, a place of public engagement and protest on very difficult issues, right? The mm-hmm. issues you choose to work on in this book, the issues that you work on in your professional life, these are some of the toughest issues in our society, right? These are the ones that are not easily solved. This is not low-hanging fruit. This is deep-rooted uh, um, uh, issues. Do Absolutely. you have a sense for how – I imagine the book is good for this – to help people who are trying to navigate – how they should show up and how they should, whether they should speak up or they should be quiet, whether they should show up or they should step back, whether they should lean in or they should get out of the way, all of which are the right things to do, depending on a circumstance of who you are and where you are and how you find yourself in the world. So um, yeah. is that part yeah. of the holy chaos that you're, that you're describing and talking it's about? like described the arc of holy chaos. So um, it's very much, I think that one of those key parts is the reflecting um, Mm. that you just named of, you know, how have I grown? What did I used to think? Um, I talk about that as the Cosby understanding of race. Mm. And, you know, I grew up with the Cosby show. And, and so if like that was this, yeah, we're all fine. Well, no, actually we're not. And, and so taking the time. And so that is one of the first steps, I think, in engaging in this work is yes, we need to show up, but first let's do some thinking and reflecting and learning and listening. And so know what, you know, where are we at and how did we get here as a society, as the United States of America, what in our history has brought us to this moment Hmm. and, and questioning that a little bit, because a lot of us did not learn this history, right? Uh, In our schools, we did not learn about the the people's history of the United States. Yes. And and so it takes some time to really understand our history. Um, there's one of my chapters that's pretty um, wonky, probably seeking to understand. It's one of my favorite chapters, but I think it won't be everybody else's favorite chapter because it's a little nerdy of understanding our history and understanding our history, uh, our religious history and our political history and the intersection of religion and politics. Uh, So first understanding like our context, as well as my own personal history. Mm -hmm. So what formed me, what shaped me, what experiences um, developed my lens for the world and not with like this uh, shame or castigating, but just a reality of, huh, okay, this is who I am. Um, this is the, what formed me. There's pieces of that that I love and I love my family and I love, 
uh, you know, all of this. And it's complicated because yeah. there's some real troubling pieces. And, and so being able to reflect on that and then pull those threads mm. that are life-giving and moving us toward justice and then being able to set aside uh, or confront in, in whatever way we need to the parts that are hurtful. Mm. Um, so that's number one, is that learning, understanding, reflecting. And then the, the, the next pieces that I'm, I really believe in are embracing curiosity so really moving to I wonder as a first posture, I wonder, and, and that opens up our brain and opens up mm. our, our being to be able to actually listen and learn and step into new spaces. So rather than quickly jumping to judgment, moving to wonder, mm. and then that next piece is showing up and showing up continually and, and building real relationships through putting yourself physically and emotionally into spaces uh, that might feel uncomfortable at first, but become patterns and become real relationships. And in that showing up, knowing that you will inevitably mess up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're human and in relationships, I will mess up. That's one thing I know. <laughs> Right. And so in here, I tell some stories of messing up in really embarrassing ways or ways that feel hurtful. And so having to learn how to forgive, mm. that that's a part of this work is learning to forgive yourself, learning to forgive others, learning to be able to move through those mistakes and, and then um, being in it in the long haul. And one of the, the pieces that I think in this is having boundaries while also having openness and wow. mm -hmm. I tie different pieces of religious teachings throughout the book. And one of the, in, in this chapter, whenever I was writing a chapter, I would reach out to some different religious friends and ask them questions. So I asked a rabbi friend, how do Jewish folks understand that um, the law and uh, unconditional love? And my rabbi uh, friend, Rabbi Brian, one of my rabbi friends, Rabbi Brian, told me about the Sephirot which is the understanding of God and in Kabbalah, which is like the 10 uh, faces of God, basically. And there's one, the right hand is this law and boundary and kind of that harsh God, right? Uh -huh. the, and, and then the left arm is the unconditional love and the, that real just openness that we mm. experience in God. And you have to have both. Hmm. You have to have that boundary and you have to have that unconditional love. And so as we navigate these spaces wow. and these relationships, I need to know where's my boundary and where's my openness and how do I stand in this space and navigate it, and move one and move yeah. the other. Uh, because when we're talking about human rights and equality, I have some boundaries. And I think of that James Baldwin quote, uh, that, and I botch it every time I need yeah. to memorize this, but it's something about like, do you know it? No, no, but no one can okay. say, even, even people that get a James Baldwin quote, right. They don't say it quite with the authority I, and the elegance right, that right. James Baldwin but does. It's so something to the extent of I'll work with you and I'll be in relationship with you unless, uh, you are denying my humanity. Yeah. And that's that boundary. Like this is where I set a, a, a line and yes. I do that with love, but it's a line. Yeah. And, and then there is the arm that is like, all right, I'm going to push myself um, to unconditional love. Yep. And, and so that dance is a part of this work. So I, I, I think that is just so helpful and so, so brilliant. And, and I wonder, you've probably heard this too, and I hear this from um, a lot of my black friends especially. They'll say, well, you have the luxury to do that. You kind of get to choose as a white person when you engage just recognize that as a black person, I don't get to decide where my bo I, my boundaries are being violated. I am being dragged in. I'm having to respond on a constant basis. And when people all of a sudden realize that the world is not um, that 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 we're not all in the same boat, you know, uh, yeah. where we. We might be in the midst of a similar storm, but some of us are in very different circumstances in the midst of that of that storm. 
the, um, that's one of the things I think that is striking to a lot of people, and I hear it right now a lot, especially with leaders who are now are saying, like, I, I don't know how I can possibly be public about any of this because the cost of being wrong, which you, you so articulately you know, invited people to do, feels um, like it's a privilege you don't you're not allowed to take. But I hear you saying, no, that's not a privilege you're allowed to take. That's a mistake you're going to make. And you either get through it now or yeah. it's going to show up later. So sort of, yeah. sort of de- deal with it. The only way out is through. <laughs> yeah. we, we have to move yeah. into these complicated yeah. spaces. Um, retreating is not an option. And, and we have hmm. to lean into them. And if we don't now, it will come later. So, you know, one of the things I find really interesting about this current place of um, social change, the call for social change, Mm -hmm. there have been many times in our history where religious communities have been part and parcel or have even been the instigators of those. That's not what's happening now. I I, I don't know how you're seeing it, but, um, man, I mean, sometimes clergy groups show up, sometimes religious organizations jump out, but... There is an entire movement calling for justice that is not rooted in faith traditions, is not asking clergy leaders, is not waiting for anyone. Is I was talking with a friend of mine, Alvin Herring, who runs Faith in Action, and he said when they got to Ferguson a few years ago, he said it was hostile, the feeling of the of the the people on the ground that have been in that work for days and weeks already by the time they got there, like, you're not welcome here. And they had to negotiate very hard how to have a presence. And I bring that up because some of us from the religious traditions, we keep wanting to access our religious and ethic, ethical reservoir as if that's the, the, uh, the well that everyone is wanting to draw from about how we're going to engage and and I think there's something up there. I think religious people who are looking back to periods of other times of social response where the church and, and other faith leaders have been significant players, I don't think that's the I don't think that's the part of the, the I don't think that's the act of the play we're in right now. Uh, do, do you see that any differently? Am I am I and maybe I'm just a little burned still about how uh, tepid and non-existent the organized faith response was here in Minneapolis where I live for the last over the last you know 19 days it's been it's been shockingly um painful to see how yeah. how, how little there has been I just don't see it happen I see a lot of gloating I see a lot of afterwards I see a lot of marches I see a lot of people wanting to turn protests into you know uh, uh, w- groups of people that they could access and and you know accomplish another another purpose for but do, do you see it I- differently it's definitely been slow here. Like our, our faith communities are just now catching up and it's been two weeks. Um, so just, you know, exactly like what you named, but I wonder if a piece of it is there's, I wonder, um, is generational as much Mm. as it is religious. Um, because I think that the younger, the generation that I don't know how it is in Minneapolis, but here, most of the protesters are under 25. Mm -hmm. Most of the people out there are, are young and, so I've been re- receiving a lot from day one. What do we do? What do we do? How can we support? And I'm nervous about coronavirus. How do we lead? I've just been telling our, our faith community that we can't gather in person because of coronavirus. <laughs> right. And now I'm going to tell them to go stand with thousands of people out on the street. Totally. I feel like this is contradictory. And, and so like a lot of questioning this. And then the other question I get is who's leading this? Yes. Who's leading this protest? Who's leading this march? Who's, who's organizing the speakers and like nobody's Always. organizing it. Nobody's coordinating speakers. Actually, you don't even have speakers people leading a, a speakers and no songs. Show. And, yeah. I mean, this is... <laughs> it is it's traveling on social media and saying, show up. So people are my, my 18 year old daughter was out there, um, you know, on the street with everybody and she would get the notification. She, she actually came to me and said, Hey, do you know if people are gathering right now? And I said, I don't know. Let me message a couple of friends who are down there. So I'm messaging. And within 30 seconds, she said, Oh, I've got four friends down there. Um, so yep. they said, yeah, they're gathering. So she's heading down that way. We're just slower. Our institutions and yes. our institutional mindset of who's the leader, what's the program, who's in charge. Yeah. The generation that is doing these movements does not think like that. And 
I don't think it's that they're any less driven by uh, ethics and values that are shaped by love God and love your neighbor and stand up for what's right. I think it's just different. So it's yeah. not run by an institutional church and our institutional church leaders don't think like the right. 25 year olds and 18 year olds who are out on the street. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. I, and, and, and I think religious leaders and faith communities just have to know that that, 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 that is, that's the set of conditions. It is. It has fundamentally changed. I, I was pulling out my phone earlier because I, I heard a podcast today. Um, it was actually an episode of the radio show uh, Fresh Air, and it was okay. with um, with a uh, a journalist named uh, Jamil's Lardy. And Jamil's Lardy works for um, uh, an alternative kind of press. Uh, group that looks at uh, policing in the country. And he made a very interesting, uh, it's actually profound, the six or seven minutes sort of intro where he sort of says, here's what I'm up to. It was just, uh, it was thoughtful and insightful at a, at a level that I, I'm still stirring from. But one of his comments was, you know, in the spiritual and ethical traditions, the notion of two wrongs don't make a right is highly esteemed and held. But mm-hmm. in our justice system, that's not what we believe. We believe just the opposite. Yeah. In fact, we believe that it's, of course, it's wrong to imprison someone. Of course, it's wrong to execute someone. Of course, it's wrong to take someone's rights from them unless they do something wrong and then it makes it right. So he said there's a conflict between the ethical and moral call that we know to be true in us and the way the American judicial system treats people. It is two wrongs making a right. And it's made right because you did something wrong. So now the thing that we otherwise wouldn't do to you. And that just that notion, right, that there is and you hear it in the George Floyd story and you hear it in the Eric Gardner story and you hear it, you know, not so much in the Brianna Taylor story. That was just a tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Mm -hmm. if he had if he only had and, you know, the police wouldn't if they didn't have to. And this is one of those conflicts, right, that. um and I think that it's been around for a long time. People who are going to take a more just uh, are going to take a more legal system approach to. And, you know, this is the response to riots, right? People burning buildings and, and, and shattering mm-hmm. things, even though I will just caveat and say, as they've investigated that stuff here in Minneapolis, mm-hmm. the people who shattered windows, the people who torched buildings, they have not arrested people and found people who are in black communities and so on. It's been uh, young white kids and white anarchists that are actually anti-capitalists that mm-hmm. are, you know, have a whole other message that, that is, is part and parcel anytime there's these kinds of turnups. So it's, it's hard to know exactly what's going on, but that you can see where the idea of, well, um, we're not going to continue to respond to a system that uses two wrongs make a right to try to uh, you know use another ethical um, response. And I think that's interesting. I think that's one of the places where it, it will be intriguing to see how we respond. And I think it causes real dissonance for people um, knowing how they should respond because we don't know how much our own criminal system, not even when it's gone wrong, but when it works right, how yeah. bad it is, how just wrong punitive justice is like we yeah. and, you know, I, I, we talk about this a lot in the worlds that I run around in uh, uh, that, you know, we probably need to make a call for non punitive justice system mm-hmm. because law and order is not the same thing as as safety and justice. So anyway, I'm pre- be, being a little preachy on your on the podcast. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. And I think that I've been thinking about that a lot, too, because um a lot of the early cries to defund the police or, you know, um, to dismantle these systems, my initial gut was, oh, but, you know, how, who will assure that those who are in need or who are being hurt? Um, so it's a real area that we need to take the time to learn and understand what that means. And I've seen some great things in the past week on what it actually means to defund the police or reduce funding and shift funding. Mm -hmm. Those might be easier ways for people who are deeply ingrained um, with uh, who are white um, to understand like what that means. 
Um, yeah. But when we step back, when we take the time to understand, oh yeah, the system is totally at odds with how I parent, <laughs> how I how I know it means to treat people. You know, like I remember when I my daughter was two, I think, or something, and she was a real pistol. <laughs> She's now 18. So, um, and I had been spanked as a child, uh, and a couple times, not a lot, but, uh, so I thought, okay, I'm so angry and frustrated and I want her to know that this is yeah. wrong. And so I spanked her and she won. She was like, what? Like didn't make any sense for her, did not yeah. stop her behavior. And I felt terrible. And I thought, well, well, wait a minute. Why am I teaching my child yes. that hitting is a way to resolve bad behavior? Like we know this and, and most people yeah. have shifted in our understanding of how to raise children and yeah. that punitive and shaming means don't actually uh, get the end result of raising a more um, balanced ethical human being right yes so why do we think that in our policing system that that same old framework will work like we've grown in other areas but we haven't transferred that growth and knowledge and understanding of humanity and treating one another yeah. and behavior change um right that that doesn't make sense and and then of course the religious and ethical um, ways of yeah. understanding it, but we haven't taken the time to see because we have this, um, you know, policing on a pedestal that's not. We haven't taken the time to reflect on it to actually yeah. make the change. And this is a call, and I see it happening. Of people, I, I do feel like I'm also feeling this tipping point, and. Quite honestly, I'm not normally a very hopeful person. That I mean, I am a hopeful person. I didn't mean that. <laughs> you just temperamentally not hopeful. In this, in this work, like I've gotten yeah. numb to yes. um, right. protests and activism. Sometimes, I mean, I still believe in it. I still do it every day. But I don't go going. Okay, this is going to make a change tomorrow. Right. I know that this is long haul work. That, that that's and, how I look at prayer. So I totally understand what you're saying. Right. Like I don't <laughs> I know that I believe in it anymore, but you know I'm still willing to give yeah, it a try. I'm still doing it. Um, the I've I've been a little jaded, and in this moment, I feel a little hopeful. Like I feel like we're seeing the tipping point in Colorado. Yes. We just had we've had a bipartisan police reform bill uh, that's about to pass. It's it's gone through each chamber and. That makes me feel a little hopeful. Like maybe we're starting to wake up to some of these things. Yeah, boy, there's, I, there's I, lots I don't feel hopeful about. I, I'm, November will be the ultimate test, won't it? Yeah, and it's you know every. Uh, I think I'm about to quote a 1990s song, but every every Rose beginning every beginning is another beginning's end or something, right? <laughs> like it's just going to start another. It's it's going to keep us going down this path. Like we have to solve the natural disaster crisis that is this presidential administration. And then there's all the work that has to be done to clean that up and still address all the issues that allowed him to be so damaging, which are, are rooted in the white body's supremacy narrative in this, in this culture. And frankly, and I know a lot of people who work in the area of racism and have taught me that Policing is not the only place where this happens, and you have to be oh, careful yeah. not to overly focus on the police. On the other hand, it is the state-sanctioned way that we still allow this to happen. We, we have um, uh, adopted two sons that are of Mexican um, heritage, and uh, our youngest son got into some neighborhood trouble a number of years ago, and is stealing, and uh, took him, you know, went with him to the police. And the police officer said, look, we're, here's the thing. We don't want to, you know, give him a straight talk kind of thing. Like, you need to knock this off because we don't want to bring the criminal justice system down on you. Because if we do, you're going to get a record and that's going to ruin your life. Now, you think, OK, here's a guy telling him the truth. I'm glad the officer was, you know, was stern with him. But why do we have a system by which once you get into it, it then ruins your life. And that is spoken by a police officer in the police station to a person like that's just how it is. And I remember looking at him and just saying when, after Chico left the room, like, man, you all need to have more options where you can be engaged with 
you know, young, young men like this, that is not basically we stay away from you or we ruin your life like right. that. There it is. Right. Like and people wouldn't be talking about this if there weren't police precincts on fire and people saying defund the police. And and I've actually become a big fan of of all of that. I think, you know, Jesus' statement of of uh, love your neighbor invokes someone to say, well, who is my neighbor? Yeah, yeah. of course, bold, clear, state, declarative statements. Some would say, well, it depends on what love is, depends on who my neighbor is. What do you what exactly do you mean by you know, yeah, that's what they should do. It should invoke that because you're being clear about what you're what, what what you're asking for causes deep implication. You know, that's um, that 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 feels like the kind of thing that your book, Holy Chaos, seems to want to address. So I, I think it's yeah. it's really good. Yeah. But the, one, one of the chapter title. Can, can I ask you about this one? It's chapter yeah. six. It's under the showing Wait, up. Before you go there, I yeah. have to tell you really fast. OK, about that story. Here's oh, another please. element of that. Yeah. I also got in trouble for shoplifting when I was 14 years old. Guess what? No one told me huh. this will ruin your life. Yeah. I, I was a 14 year old girl out with friends who were being stupid. One of them was older, said, you know, put a pair of earrings in your pocket. This story's not in my book. I don't tell many people about this one. Um, and, but we are recording. Got called. I had to, I got a ticket, I had to go to court um, do all of that, but I was treated in a very different mm -hmm. way than your son was yep. as a young man of color. Yep. And I, I remember, do you remember the criming when white, um, mm -hmm. things that went around, I think in 2014 of, we all have stories of making mistakes when we were young, we've all done stupid things. Yeah. Those mistakes did not ruin my life. Um, for other people, yep. those mistakes wind up ruining their life. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Go on. No, and there it is, and there and therein lies the statement of the of of the set of conditions. You know, we're not all experiencing the same way. So, yeah. so chapter six is entitled "Showing Up: Friendship yeah. as a Political Act." Mm -hmm. um, okay. Can I give you my little why I'm interested yeah. in asking you about this? Uh, it has yeah. been my. I, I need you know. I I need encouragement to return to my to my great call. I, I have long believed that human connection and human friendship and um, feeling responsible for one another is what we have to do. I actually think it replaces family narrative. I mm -hmm. think friendship is more powerful than family only in this sense that so much pain happens in families. So much uh, uh, domestic abuse is inside of families. The ancient uh, creation narratives, you know, for the Hebrew people involve brother killing brother and brothers selling brothers off and people. Mm -hmm. uh, so family is not a great, it's not a great call friendship. And I think, you know, Jesus says, you know, we, I call you friends and I don't call you servants. And there's this, there's this idea that you care for one another as friends is like this super, super high calling. And I've tried to build up a, a life of work around that. And I'm just kind of losing total faith in that. Like, <laughs> I've sort of come to the point of like, look, you know what? You know what matters? Power. Power is the only thing that matters. Not friendship. None of the rest of that stuff matters. It's uh, you can be racist, but if you have no power, I don't care. But if you have power and you're racist, then you're a problem. So mm. all I care about is not if I know you, if I understand you. I care about if you have power or not. And if you have power, do you use it for good or do you use it for evil? And that's it. So I'm sort of becoming, you know, that jaded person. So anyway, haven't read the chapter yet. And I'm hoping uh, showing up friendship as a political act, uh, you could save me from my darkest hours here. <laughs> uh, so, ev so evangelize me again. Yes, yes. So it's funny, as you're saying this, my um, my neighbor, who's my best friend, is walking across my yard, and I'm going, oh, this is so funny. My my best friend, my deepest friendship is walking through my yard. Um, so when I, in this chapter, I guess I'm not talking about um, befriending the Ku Klux Klan member as mm -hmm. the way to move political power. I'm talking about, um, and so th this story starts with uh, the day after the Pulse nightclub shooting in 2015, I believe that was. And the morning after that shooting, when I, I rolled over and looked at my phone and saw that, yeah. that people had been killed in a nightclub in Florida, and 
I had two thoughts. One was, I hope that the shooter wasn't Muslim. Um, we were yep. in the lead up to the 2016 election yep. and there was already so much uh, uh, Islamophobic, uh, anti-Islam rhetoric. And, and I was concerned about there being a reinforcement. And, and then the next thought was about my LGBTQ, and at the time I didn't know Latinx, but LGBTQ friends who would be feeling such deep pain wow. and, and fear in that moment. So in that time, I immediately called upon and, and quickly actually then learned that the shooter had been a Muslim man who was mentally ill. And it was not, you know, I think like so many of these things, it was a deeper story. But anyway, yeah. um, the first things I did was call my friends. Hmm. And I called my friend who's the head of one Colorado, who's a, a gay, actually Latinx man. And, and then I called my Muslim friends and was on the phone with Kusair, who hmm. was worked with the Colorado Muslim society. And, uh, I actually was, had, my daughter had a soccer game that morning at 10, which was, you know, a normal Sunday. And so I'm sitting on the soccer sidelines calling that my friends, my friend, uh, Dave, who was with One Colorado, to find out, okay, how can I support you? What do you need in this moment? Uh, and he said, I want to make sure that we are in communication with the Muslim mm. community to make sure wow. that there, this is not causing a deeper division. So because I had that friendship before this yeah. moment with Dave, and by friendship, I mean we had had coffee. We had learned each other's stories. I knew where he was from. I knew his religious background and how that had shaped him and how it had been growing up as a gay man in that space. And that had come from, I think I'd been mm -hmm. in this work for about a year and we had just gotten to know each other and, and genuinely cared about each other's yeah. stories. And, and then I was able to call Cousser, who I also had developed a friendship with because we had responded to other things and we had been working together as well as I knew that he had two children and his wife and, and his background and his story. And I'd gone to lunch with their whole law firm and um, he's a civil rights attorney and a Muslim man. And because of those friendships in that moment, I was able to build that bridge and make sure that uh, there was a press conference that the Muslim community called for that afternoon to, to denounce the violence, um, which I think is, you know, how many white folks have a press conference every time there's right. a young white male that that shoots in a school. Um, anyway, he wanted to make sure that the LGBTQ community knew that they stood with him. And so I was able to get those connected groups connected and they were able to have a press conference side by side. And then the next night there was a, a large vigil at our, our local mm -hmm. LGBTQ nightclub. That's a, a space of refuge and safety. And we made sure that there were Muslim folks there speaking at the vigil to say, you know, we, we aren't going to let this divide us. So when I talk about friendship as a political act in this chapter, I'm talking about taking mm -hmm. the time to build those genuine, authentic yeah. relationships across our differences so that when we need to move power, when we need to stand together at the protest or the rally, that we are, um, we care about each other, that we're not just there mm -hmm. for that um, movement, which I'm, you know, that's great, but it's different when I know your story. Yeah. I'm there in a different way. Well, thank you uh, uh, personally for that. And, uh, and obviously for for the the book um so i hope it does i hope it does very well I, I i think you know this notion of there being holy chaos i think is such a great metaphor can you talk a little bit about that the 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 metaphor and why you uh decided to put the, these two phrases together uh yeah. in this way i think i mean one is just my <laughs> my if you've been uh just in the past couple minutes there have been children walking in and there's dogs barking and there's neighbors coming mm -hmm. across the lawn and i've got 10 baby hamsters upstairs if anybody wants one and chickens i know my my daughter's sister hamsters aren't sisters uh so like my life is chaos and and there's something about like the messiness of life that mm -hmm. i just love and i love walking into those difficult complicated spaces 
personally and outside of my home. Mm -hmm. And so in those spaces, my experiences that every once in a while I'll feel this Mm. breath of this. Yeah. This is holy. This is the real connection. When I retreat, and I like to do that sometimes. I mean, I feel holy there too. Mm-hmm. But there's there's a retreat version that's a running away to comfort. Yeah. And I feel called to the messy spaces where it's uncomfortable. Mm. And I think that that's where the holy is found. Uh, and so that's where the title comes from. And I also have to name a caveat that... Uh, I hesitated a little bit because I kept hearing this word chaos used around the Donald Trump presidency Mm -hmm. Um, because he does um, promote chaos and he seems to like uh, to divide and to create chaos. And, and so I think that there is a kind of chaos that invites holiness and there's a kind of chaos that invites disruption and Mm -hmm. division and pain. So I think there's a level of discernment Mm -hmm. around a chaos that invites life and a chaos that invites death. Mm -hmm. And, and so part of stepping into that is to find the holy and move that direction and, and to not um, chaos for chaos sake is not the same as holy chaos, stepping into the uncomfortable spaces well, it is. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be a timely book. It's. It already feels like it is, and uh, I hope everyone uh, gets a copy of it. Thanks, Doug. You are it's so welcome. Yeah, so so good talking to you.